Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bobby Tables on Swiss Cyberstorm TV with the breaking news. At SCS 2020 in a nutshell, Dr. Christian Fellini will conduct an exclusive live interview with two leading voices from the Swiss security community. Mr. Florian Schutz, federal delegate for cybersecurity, will take the first seat, and he will be joined by Professor Eduard Bunyan, vice president for information systems at the EPFL in Lausanne. The conversation promises interesting insights into several hot topics of 2020. Hello, thank you for joining. We're here in Lausanne at the EPFL, and we're going to do an interview with, uh, on my left, Florian Schutz, cyber delegate of Switzerland, and like our host today, EPFL Vice President uh, Edouard Bunion. I don't, don't want to go too deep into the biographies, so maybe touch on that during the talks. Obviously, uh, I heard you guys, you talked a lot together during springtime, during corona pandemic. I heard you talked more to each other than your respective families. Uh, would you elaborate on that a bit? How was your relationship there? I can confirm it's actually the third time that uh, Florian and I see each other face to face with masks on, of course, this <laughs> time. So welcome to EPFL. Uh, so yeah, I was involved deeply into the development of what became Swiss COVID. And uh, Florian was, of course, uh, in his responsibility as the cyber security czar, uh, responsible to sign off on the properties of the system. And it's been quite a, quite a ride. Absolutely. I'm sure of that. So uh, I kind of learned uh, the, uh, the tracing app is Carmela Troncoso's baby. And would you be then the godfather of it? Is that the right role for you? I mean, you introduced it to the Apple and, and Google Teams. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, the, the protocol clearly is the brainchild of uh, Professor Carmela Troncoso and her team. Um, what I did is my, my background is operating systems. So I spent okay. my entire career building systems that could be operated, that could be virtualized understanding the relationship between hardware and software and operating systems. And what we clearly recognize is that this was not only a, a protocol problem, it was also going to be an operating system problem, and particularly the interaction with the operating systems of Google and Apple, which is why I spend uh, many of my evenings in the spring uh, in conversation <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Cupertino and, and Mountain View to work out what was necessary in order for these uh, decentralized applications to emerge. Very good. So uh, you took the idea and make it into a real, working on a real operating system. And so Florian, you were the relationship partner for Ed and the EPFL and the development teams. And you can explain this to the government. What would that role be? Is that a kindergarten teacher role or? <laughs> Fortunately not. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, when projects go at a high, uh, it feels a little bit like kindergarten, but, but that's <laughs> just the, the normal. No, actually we had a, a much broader role, I think. There were many more parties involved than were just mentioned. Uh, we had in the lead the, the Bundesamt für Gesundheit. Um, we had the cantons, which uh, had to play a role. Um, we have many different players. So our main role was to make sure that we do internal security testing of the final product before then pushing it through a public security test. And after that, actually, uh, taking reports on potential vulnerabilities and triaging them to the right parties that they can get fixed. Okay, so you see, so you took like a coordinating role, a bit of a turntable, but security testing is it something you have in mind with the National Cyber Security Center? So I, I don't think we can do testing at a scale. That's not how we're set up and I don't think that's how we should set up. I do think our strength lies in the coordination and in the involvement of the right groups. Yeah. However, of course, I do require that we also have people that can actually verify reports and that also have the technical depth yep. to sometimes, you know, drill into something that is interesting. Okay, good. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll get back to that afterwards again. I hear the app now has more than one and a half million users in Switzerland. I hear even the service is improving with certain cantons. Next job seems to be integrating that in the European union application that's probably on the political level are they really playing hardball with us using the app and the help of their citizens when they travel to switzerland to make us sign the association treaty is that really the game here why we're not uh, allowed into the app so far 
So I'll take the easy part of the answer, <laughs> which is I'll give the background and then I'll turn it over to Florian for the interpretation. So the easy part is uh, the protocol is designed to allow uh, national applications to operate separately for the residents uh, of their own countries. But of course, whenever somebody goes across borders, that there's an exchange of information so that you can be protected, uh, both yourself and if you were to get infected, you can protect the people and notify the people that you were in touch with even in another country. And this requires a level of technical interoperability. From a protocol and implementation perspective, this is something that is fully worked out. This is something that um, a uh, European uh, federated gateway is, going to be put, is being put in place. It's going to be running uh, out of a data center in Luxembourg, and it's going to be um, coordinating the access and exchanging the data from a, a number of European countries. Now that uh, set of your countries is uh, to be determined, and this is where I'll turn it over to Florian about the Swiss <laughs> situation. I mean, I, I, I can't really comment on the political dimension because I, I'm not in the lead there or, or not heavily involved. I can comment on uh, a little bit on security collaboration. So um, I don't think uh, security collaboration will be an issue because we already have very strong collaborations with the different European states. For example, uh, using the network of the European GovCerts, we're tightly embedded there. And, and collaborating and helping each other. Um, so I do think in the end there's, uh, as with everything, multiple dim dimensions involved. I think the technical dimension is one that's almost solved at least, um, and the rest we'll see how it works out. Okay, and then that happens apparently on the political level because the technical level is worked out and somebody else has to take charge of that. Yes. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Good. Uh, we're plague with uh, vulnerabilities every day. I, I, I'd like to check the CVE numbering, and we're up to 20,000 already, and it's only early October. Certainly a new record again and again. One of them stuck out a bit in September was this blaze of thing. So the Bluetooth low energy spoofing attack that will allow an attacker to spoof on server devices and send out unindicated data. The way I read it, they could be used to eardrop on phone calls and people using the Bluetooth devices in webinars, uh, telcos, but it's probably also in f uh, touching on the tracing app a bit. Could you elaborate on that? No, so it's actually, so I think the vulnerability you're referring to is one that is tied to connection-based Bluetooth um, uh, establishment between devices. And um, the tracing app, uh, Swiss COVID in Switzerland, uh, uses uh, simply beacons to exchange information, so there's Doesn't no establishment that. of connections. It's different technology. So it's a different technology, different lower level protocol, but of course this vulnerability is, uh, you know, it's an example of the fact that we live in a world that is imperfect, where there's a lot of devices. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the bugs can be fixed in uh, firmware, sometimes uh, they cannot be fixed in firmware. And so you end up having, in some rare cases, even the situation where, where there are some devices and hardware devices and peripherals that are out there in the market that cannot be patched, cannot be fixed, and they're still used by people. Okay, yeah, that is a recurring problem, of course. Yeah, maybe time to leave COVID behind now. There's one question. I mean, this is a huge data collection trove. Um, and you can, I'm sure a sociologist had a lot of interest in how long do people meet each other? How close do they get to one another, north of the Alps, south of the Alps? Uh, where is partying happening, where it's not, and stuff like that. But I also get the feeling it would be an interesting instrument to measure the efficiency of different cantons, how, how they work and how they interact and who is improving and is this digitalization actually working or is it more? So, so I, can, I can respond to this. So on the first point, and I, I kind of know the way you were putting the question, right? we don't collect any of that, nor can we, can we actually collect any of that. What's fundamental about the, the, the approach is that the information that is uh, collected by the phone stays on the phone and is never shared with a third party. So there's actually no global view of things. So that you cannot do. That but we cannot do at all. So that we're not delivering any insights. What, what we do have is right now we're at the level where, uh, and unfortunately because of, of course, the epidemic situation, we're at the level where we've, we've, we've well ex exited the, the range of the law of small numbers. And we now have some statistical statistically significant uh, insights into how the various parts of the countries are, are using the app because of the people who call the hotline. So to give you a few numbers, uh, if you look over the last few weeks, a few days, uh, there are well over 200 codes entered every single day by people who are infected and contagious and were provided a COVID code by the cantonal physician. And that leads to the automatic notification to the network. 
And then people in the network have, uh, first of all, they have the opportunity to change their behavior and, and break infection chains by, by simply changing and adjusting their behavior. They have the right to a free test that's established in the law. Uh, and they also have the ability to call a dedicated hotline just for these people uh, to get advice and in some cases to ask to be, to be quarantined. And, and the number of calls on that hotline just yesterday on a single day was 600. Every day is breaking new records. So we're now at the point where we, we know where we, we, we have a sense of the use of the product. Uh, it is, it is, it's demonstrating its efficacy and its efficiency and its speed. And speed is everything in this, speed is everything in this right. pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the, the hotline does uh, have some statistical information about the cantonal, uh, the cantonal residents of the, of the people. And so we know the cantons that basically get more calls with respect to the number of cases and the ones that have less. And we can attribute it to um, you know, many things, but one of the main ones being the efficiency of the various cantonal processes. We have 26 of them in the country. Yeah, and they're not all the same. We have 26 flavors. <laughs> we don't get to choose yours, but you have 26 flavors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see that. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, Florian, you, you obviously took uh, immediately uh, an important leading role during the pandemic with the COVID tracing app, etc. You could say it was probably a bit of a blessing for the new National Cybersecurity Center. I don't know if you would put it that way. But it established yourself in an important position in Bern, which was probably not so easy first. Well, you know, with risk comes opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the important part. I do think what we have proven with the National Center for Cybersecurity, that basically was very young, a um, uh, little bit on the history. I joined last August. Um, we actually founded the uh, reporting entity where citizens and companies can report problems to 1st of January and we have the legal baseline uh, fully into place for everything I do and the, uh, my colleagues do in the, in the core group of cyber and the steering committee and the cyber outshows uh, in place since 1st of July. So I think we certainly proved that we can actually deliver uh, even if we're not fully set up, even if things are sometimes a bit chaotic and even if uh, people have to work extra shifts. And I must say, I was very, very impressed by actually our employees that uh, really did double shift because they believed in uh, the good of the things. And it's not just the Swiss COVID app. I mean, you have to see, we faced a shift in attacks. We didn't see more attacks. We faced a shift using the COVID theme. But yeah. we were also very, very cautious about our hospitals because, you know, we feared that now is the time to actually attack hospitals because now they're more likely to pay a ransom, for example. Yeah, so ransomware gets new targets now and will be a perfect moment. Well, they didn't in Switzerland. It turned out, you know, not to be a problem here. It was a problem in some countries, but this also led us to develop technology where we actually could support the hospitals. Right. So at the same time, while supporting the app, we developed new um, services and, well, let me call it prototypes, not products, to actually support them. We uh, pulled up new processes. And at the same time, what we did is really, it's for, for example, for this uh, uh, security testing, we also sort of documented a very, very uh, lightweight process. We did the calculation of what it costs so we can repeat it. And I think it shows that even in government, we can actually use a uh, approach where we start small and then get better. Oh, that, yeah, that is surprising that you can do that in government. <laughs> that's true. Well, yeah. In my opinion, actually, it's not that surprising. I mean, look, I came from the outside. I had my, uh, my, my ideas. But actually, what you have in government is a lot of very motivated people across all departments. Mm -hmm. And they want to collaborate, right? Now, it's not always easy within the structures that exist. And for example, one specialty is if something is not forbidden for you, you can just do it, right? Yeah. For us as government employee, it's different. If it's not allowed, we're not allowed to do, do it, it right? Yeah, yeah. So that was also why we needed the law for the, for this with COVID uh, app and, and everything. And that just, you know, changed a little bit the dynamics around. Yeah. So just to repeat it, this is because you're not entitled to fulfill a certain role, you cannot do it unless the law, the parliament, grants you the right to investigate it or do this, perform this action, if yeah. you will. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly tricky for uh, people not working for government. 
I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's always a trade-off between speed, but also, you know, being uh, sustainable. It has also positive effects, right? It refrains us from just jumping on the next bandwagon right. and do the next cool thing, yeah. right? So we've got to think it through. It yeah. forces yeah. us to also explain it to a lot of different stakeholders, to lawyers, to uh, the population, to parliamentarians. You know, we, we have to, to make sense of the idea. And I think that's actually a good thing because you want, you want solutions that consist. And for example, if you look at the uh, Melanie, which is now part of the National mm -hmm. Cybersecurity Center, that was founded uh, 2004, actually. And this is 15 years old. And I remember back in the time, I was working in Switzerland, I was working close to government, and uh, other states actually had the discussion that they pulled all these structures in place for cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And Switzerland just started with a small entity mm. that actually delivered value. Mm. You know, we didn't scale yet. That's it true. didn't. It wasn't mm. perfect, right? And actually, we came a long way. And Melanie, for example, has an excellent reputation across and Europe. It has an excellent um, reputation given the size of it. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's yeah. on equal height with different uh, states which have huge organizations yeah. behind them. And I think it's important that we don't forget that, right? Yeah. While I'm generally a very critical person and I like to poke around on the things that do not work, uh, I also think we need to, to see that in, in, in government actually, and not everything is slow and, and you know, not working. We, we, have <laughs> some, we have some pretty nice things. Yeah, glad to hear that. So uh, Touching that again, so Switzerland is somehow a bit of a federalistic mess when it comes to cyber initiatives. Personally, think that is actually a good thing from a resilience perspective because there's so many people interacting, but speed is a problem there. Would you say you get to be a moderator in this, uh, in all these uh, conversations? Is that your role, or is it more the security testing thing? I think it's a, it's a layered role, right? So first and foremost, it's best if I'm not needed, right? If it just yeah. works. Uh, people need to understand, especially owners of businesses, that they are responsible for their business. This is not my role. So you're not uh, doing their job. You're not no, protecting them. You know, as long as it's not a critical infrastructure. If a company yeah. gets out of business, there's competition that fills the gap. That's how markets work, right? And that's important to understand. So. Um, my role is to prevent systemic crisis. That's, mm -hmm. that's one part. Together with my colleagues, right, I'm not doing that on my own. We have very different parts in, in government. Um, but before we get there, it's, and that's the reactive part, there's a lot of preventive things. So, so one is really, we need to generate framing conditions where actually businesses can invest in their security in a sensible manner while uh, keeping the innovation up, while also, you know, not having to spend too much money, so we stay attractive. And there come a lot of topics. So, for example, can we build very, very resilient infrastructure as a default? So if you look today at ISPs, uh, they have great differences about the security they provide. And some will charge you for everything they do in security. Uh, some will not even let you know what they do. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is, a, is a, you know, but is this something that you would make transparent, or is that a role for you, making that transparent across so my the country, role is to or no. give a baseline, look, this is what you ISP should do? My role is to think about framing conditions. So let me give you one very specific mm -hmm. example. A couple of weeks ago, there was an increase in DDoS attacks on financial institutions. Financial institutions are in a critical sector. So we asked ISPs to please block obviously malicious uh, requests, right? This is not about censorship, it's really about 100% identifiable requests. And, and on the network level. Because on the network level, yeah. because, okay. you know, they, they do the routing, they own the infrastructure, right. they can do that for okay. their clients, actually. Um, now, of course, some of them sell it as a service, right? So some providers just told us, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, they argumented with freedom of speech, Page? which yeah. does not apply if it's criminal activity, right? Um, so... And, and some of them did, right? Yeah. But with the clients, with the banks, actually, they did not know whether the provider took the measures or not. And we're not allowed to inform them <laughs> who did and who didn't. Um, so, so this brings a situation where no one benefits in the end, right? Prices are not transparent because you could pay a very low price. Uh, the only thing you see is how fast is your uh, internet access. Um, and, and I see it in our role 
to not just regulate, right? I mean, we need to apply regulation uh, if it's necessary to protect our critical infrastructure and our society, but also to find systems where we can increase the transparency so that all the different participants in a, uh, in a system can win uh, on, a, on a fair basis. Yeah, I see. Good. Uh, we're halfway through uh, the national cybersecurity strategy, the second edition of that. Um, could you give us a brief status? And what is really interesting me is this notification obligation yeah. that was put into it. You need to examine it. In summer, you, you, you did an interview and said, this is coming to Switzerland. There is going to be an obligation to report cyber incidents. Well, I must correct slightly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet decided. So it's we will we will basically what we are we are working on a a draft on how such a reporting duty could be structured, how it could look like, how could it be embedded in existing laws, or do we need to generate the new law? And we will then give a recommendation to the Federal Council in December, and then they will take a decision how to take that forward. That's the important part. We're not taking the political decisions. Yeah, but right? again, they're going to do what um, we recommend, don't um, they? Not always, <laughs> uh, but you know, at least we recommend them. We, uh, it is our job to make the options transparent and, and show the effects of that options. Uh, my personal view is that they, uh, 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 an obligation for critical infrastructure could make sense because we do have some problems in Switzerland. We don't really know how many incidents do we really have. It's voluntarily to report them, right? Yeah. So some do, some don't. Uh, this makes it difficult for us to then say, okay, where do we need to invest, right? Is yeah. ransomware the big problem? Is it criminality? Is it DDoS. online fraud? Is it DDoS, yeah. right? So where are the problems? Where should we focus? Um, does it make sense to work with the ISP to increase the resiliency of their infrastructure, or do we actually need to work with the critical infrastructure itself? Um, and, and I think there it makes sense. It doesn't make sense to have a reporting duty where you report each and every attack. That, yeah. That's not what's interesting, right? Yeah, you're not interested in that. Uh, no. But it would make Switzerland comparable to other European countries, wouldn't it? For statistical purposes, that I would mean, be interesting. They don't really have the statistics as well. And even okay. if we have it, there's a high dark figure. Now, now, what do you consider an attack? If you get an alert because um, of the DDoS, well, you probably have thousands of attacks a day. Yeah. Right. I, I use the rule of thumb in my previous professions. I said it's a attack if I lose money. Right. Even if yeah. it's just 50 Swiss francs, it's, it's a successful attack. Yeah. Right? And, and then you come to, depending on your company, you know, a couple of days. That's the average. If you don't see a couple of day uh, attacks where you lose then money you're and you're uh, <laughs> uh, depending on online resources, you're probably not seeing uh, what's happening. Um, <laughs> But, but that's the thing. So even that isn't interesting, right? What's interesting is an attack that actually endangers the functioning of a critical infrastructure such that they can provide the service. And the Germans, for example, did a very interesting thing there. They basically said, if it potentially affects X amount of people, because you know, your, your, your power transformator uh, close to a rural region, um, even though it's unpleasant for those affected, is probably not generating as much damage as one in an industrial zone. And so we need to find measures for that. Yeah, I see. National cybersecurity policy, is that something affecting you as a university, the research community at all, or is this something happening in Bern where they no, do so meetings it, about it? It's both sort of an operational topic and it's also a research topic, right? And it's an operational topic because we are, we are part of the critical infrastructure as well. I mean, Florian talked about the national network. The national network is obviously one of the many aspects of the critical, of the critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There are many other aspects of, of our digital lives that basically collectively form the critical infrastructure of the country, and, and we happen to be running a number of them. So we're faced with it. We, we have a network that is also constantly under attack and that we need to respond. So this is sort of on the operational side. And then on the research side, of course, we, we study all aspects of computing, offensive, defensive aspects of computing. Uh, we have uh, experts in identifying security vulnerabilities in different systems, and that's part of what we do from a research perspective. Um, this is also how you end up understanding systems, right? If you don't understand what, is con what the systems consist of, then it's very difficult to have an educated <laughs> view of what is actually happening. And what is misbehavior and what yeah. is standard behavior? And right? the complexity, of course, is, 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 is daunting, right? There, there's a very famous luminary in, in uh, distributed systems that said many decades ago that, the definition of a distributed system is when you cannot get any work done because a computer you've never heard of is not working. 
right? <laughs> and, uh, and of course, now we're in a, we're in a phase where, where the number of things that could fail and impact our ability to operate professionally is extremely high. Right. And, right? really and we need to make, from a resiliency perspective, a certain set of assumptions, right? And this is how we think about continuity. This is how we think about uh, resiliency in the case of attacks. By the way, this is also how you think in terms of COVID, where suddenly everybody had to work from home. And then so you realize whether you have the infrastructure that scale or doesn't scale. It's not stricto sensu a security issue, first order, but it is all about uh, scaling. And, and scaling and the ability for our infrastructure to scale is a critical part of the response. And some, uh, very often it's uh, underlooked. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, maybe if I can add here, it's also, it's very important. Um, we have excellent uh, universities and education in Switzerland, right? And we have, for example, strong collaboration with EPFL and ETH Zurich. Um, so the Swiss COVID app was one. I just uh, met with Professor Payo, who's doing the re vulnerability mm -hmm. research a lot in Bluetooth and systems, which of course we also have a, a, a good exchange, right? Which helps us if there's something that could affect critical infrastructure. We're discussing these opportunities. Um, uh, we work very closely with ETH Zurich, with Professor Perik, who's the behind Cyan, a very, very promising project. Mm -hmm. um, uh, where I think there's big national interest mm -hmm. as well to roll this out to, to secure our infrastructure better with a better routing uh, protocol. Um, then uh, also uh, one thing where, that I would like to address uh, is, at least from my personal experience, a lot of my colleagues today come to me and say, well, no, you know, Florian, and, you know, we studied at ETH, that's where we know each other from. And they tell me, you know, Florian, I think I'm leaving Switzerland. I, there's just no career in IT in Switzerland. Okay. I'm not taken seriously by the management, you know. And if I go to one of the international tech companies, they take me seriously. You don't get senior vice president technology in an international technology company if you don't know about technology. In Switzerland, you can get CIO. You can, you can get very far without knowing anything about technology. And, and that's yeah. a problem, right? I, I, I wouldn't hire a CFO that doesn't know about finances. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm not saying that the CFO must have been in finances all the life, but that person needs to get the basics right and needs to understand the matter. And so it's a pity that we have very high-ranking universities, so ETH, uh, Zurich, and EPFL among the top universities in, in the world. Technology. And we're actually seeing a shortage of talent because they leave the country and they do the innovation somewhere else. Or even worse, they start it here and then go abroad. And we yeah. make it very difficult, A, for startup in Switzerland, and B, um, we make it very difficult for people to have a, a career here. And I think we need to change that. I'm not sure if you agree yet. Well, so but you came back, I, I, you? I, well, I left first. <laughs> and I, I, I was in the US for the better part of my career. I lived in the US for 18 years. So, so this was home for me. Uh, I did came back. I came back to a different world. When I left, it was very clear that there was no career in technology. So it improved. Well, so, so uh, the, the way I, I, I explain this often is, is Switzerland made the decision a few generations ago that, that IT and in general the digital field was something we would simply buy and operate. And we would not worry about owning it in, or developing it in any particular way. And we buy, buy a lot of equipment, we bought a lot of equipment. And the Swiss IT community is extremely good at operating equipment that was developed elsewhere. elsewhere. Right? Yeah. Now, if you think about the, the decision, it was an implicit decision, of course, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, it makes sense. Switzerland doesn't do many things, right? We don't yeah, make cars. We buy a lot of things. We buy cars. So, so okay, yeah. we buy computers, we buy cars. Uh, things are changing now. And I think this is where there's a real opportunity is because now there's nothing to buy because the IT industry is no longer in the business of selling products that can be operated locally. Uh, they're in the business of delivering cloud services. And so we have a different model where we either have to operate cloud services or we have to uh, develop the necessary critical part of the infrastructure that we want to deliver for our country, our citizens, our companies, as part of what is known these, these days called a sovereign cloud strategy. And I think that's where there's an opportunity for the community at large. Okay, interesting. Uh, let's get back on that afterwards. Uh, I'd like to finish off the the cybersecurity center and the cyber strategy of this government. Uh, a problem that was around, maybe historically, with Melanie was competence. I mean, uh, give you a completely hypothetical example. 
if the military would be w would get a, a server exploited, some unpatched server, would you have the competence to lay your hands on that server to do the forensic nowadays? Is that sorted out, or is this still a hot issue? Well, I think if I personally do the forensic, it'll take too long. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I can still do some stuff. If I've not <laughs> done that in team. many years. No, uh, choking aside. Um, a, uh, you mentioned the military. The military has the Führungsunterstützungsbasis as the IT provider. We have different IT providers within government. They are responsible for their own security first and uh, foremost. That's why they have a security team with the very good security people, actually. Um, the thing is, when an attack now happens with the new ordinance in place, um, they need to report it to me. Now, it is not my goal to take over control. It is my goal to inform the others and to see the risk and then determine, uh, is the risk becoming too high? Do we actually need to coordinate it on an interdepartmental basis? So do we actually to need to involve the yeah. GovCert? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, even on a daily basis, uh, whether it's the, 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 the Department of Defense or Department of Justice yeah. or any of the other departments mm -hmm. or the bit in our own department, um, uh, people help each other. That's already working on a working level. Okay, it's working on a working level. And you think the competence just slowly being sorted out because the more you establish and the stronger the center becomes. Look, it's a pretty uh, normal thing. People that are competent like to work with people that are competent. <laughs> okay, so, okay. so that's happening. I do think where we need to improve is on a process level yeah. and on the leadership level. And okay. before my role was founded, there was no real coordinated action Same towards defining method. these processes. And we still have a way to go oh. there to define them. But you know, we're working on that, we're collaborating, we're working more uh, together. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a positive development. Okay. We still have a way to go though. Okay, good. Um, Ed, I, I saw open sourcing of the COVID tracing app as a signal in Switzerland. That is publicly interesting. That is a privacy affecting app and we kind of have it in the law that it has to be open source. Do you think is that is that a trend? Is this the way it has to be or could it be different? And Florian, do, do you agree that uh, that like government the law is making things like like mandatory like transparency, open access, etc. What do you guys think? I mean in the case of, of the app, if, if you think about why it became a success, right? It, it's a combination of technical and non-technical yeah. aspects, right? On the technical aspects, why we, we developed a, a product that works, it's not perfect, right? It, uh, there's a very large number of constraints and that we had to work through. But it's a pragmatic approach. It's a pragmatic approach, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Remember yeah. one thing in this pandemic, nothing has to be perfect. It's the it's the combination of different imperfect mitigation and prevention and measures speed that, that will uh, let us to, to fight this pandemic. Uh, and then we have next to the technical aspects, we have the sort of the non-technical aspects, which are aimed at ensuring transparency and confidence. And, and one of them was, was we want to make sure it was very important that this was a, a voluntary and non-discriminatory use of an application, right? You can use it, you don't right have in to, the law. and you cannot be discriminated. And the other one is to make sure that we had a best practice approach to transparency in particular by making sure that the, the application was open sourced. And, and, and to me, it's actually kind of a, a relatively straightforward uh, evolution of what uh, citizens should expect out of government applications. As soon as you start putting any kind of algorithmic decision making into a government process that affects the life of citizens, it's fundamental that this is open sourced, right? For example, uh, France has a very, very complex algorithmic based way of dealing with uh, admissions into higher education, right? That's their, it's their Earth educational system. system. And, and whether the, the, the system is good or not good is not the point. The point is it's essential that there's some level of transparency yeah. about how it is implemented okay. so that people who are going through the system have a sense of fairness. What is uh, happening to them? Yeah. What is happening to them? to them? And I think this is something that we can learn from, you can generalize. The notion of transparency of reporting of, of when things work and when things don't work is actually becoming the norm. And one thing we have not mentioned yet because it is not the law of the land in Switzerland, right? And uh, is GDPR, right? But GDPR, mm -hmm. even though it's not the land of Switzerland, it is absolutely the law of the land for all of the companies that do business with people who live yeah. within the European yeah. Union. And I know cases where you end up having a situation where you have a, a data breach. These things do happen. Yeah. If it involves a relatively large databases, you end up very quickly having to notify multiple agencies in Europe 
potentially all 28 of them, and then you don't have to notify the source, right? And that is because the law doesn't require that there's a notification in the case of a data breach. The revision, by the way, of the data protection law is actually not going all the way to the neck, to the levels that are expected yeah. with GDPR. So yeah. we, we have a situation uh, on, on the Swiss side where we have a, uh, we need to operate, uh, particularly in the private sector, with a global environment where, and at the risk of offending uh, legal scholars of Switzerland, right, <laughs> where Swiss law doesn't really matter that much because when it comes to the digital world, um, the reality is it's the European Order, data protection law that matters when it comes to data. And it's the American law when it, that matters when it comes to cybersecurity and the, 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 the potential legal risk of having some uh, warrants to access data even when, when the systems are overseas. Yeah, I see. Yeah, Aaron, I mean, I, I'm sure uh, you're sitting in different uh, government bodies where these topics are discussed. Is, 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 is it true? And do you see the same trend or you think transparency as, is as important? I, I don't get transparency, particularly Swiss quality. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't agree on that. I do think transparency is a Swiss okay. quality, uh, though we need to define what does transparency mean, right? So I 100% I, I agree with what Ed said, but saying something is open source and now it's transparent, in my opinion, is just plain wrong, right? Open source can be one measure to, to build transparency. transparency and trust. There are others. So, you know, I trust... Could you replace it um, with something else? Yeah, sure. I okay. mean, look, if you, if you have, and that's a personal opinion of mine, right? Yeah. If, if you put out a product and you tell me it's been verified by, I don't know, by the National Center of yeah. Cybersecurity, little self, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, choking aside, but you know, it's been verified by EPFL, it's been uh, verified mm -hmm. by the CCC, uh, net neutrality, those people looked at it, and uh, you know, uh, probably Microsoft reviewed, I don't know, right? I gonna trust that application more than the Linux kernel. Because, you know, uh, we actually have the example Linux kernel had a problem in the SSL module that was undiscovered for years. Just because it's open source just means everyone can look at it. Doesn't Quite often that means no one it. does, right? Yeah, yeah, and even there, when we look at code, it's very complex, right? So by looking at it, you don't really gain anything. So you need to do the analysis, you know, you need to use semi-formal or formal methods in order to really come to a conclusion. So um, it's, it's just one measure. Uh, and that's that's from the security aspect, right? Uh, the second uh, thing really is that um, we do actually discuss a lot how can we gain the trust of the target groups. Quite often in government, these are the citizens or these are companies. Um, now, it's not always straightforward because there are different interests involved, right? Sometimes you have a service provider that provides a service that wants in the end to earn some money with providing that service. Um, you have uh, an, uh, an operator of infrastructure, you have maybe a uh, political intention behind it. And you, you, you got to bring that all together and, and build a solution that is trustworthy enough um, to be adapted. And uh, I think that's the puzzle uh, that, yeah, uh, I, I, that we're I trying to solve. That. Yeah, I mean, trust is a hard problem and how, and how it doesn't come out of thin air yeah. somehow. You wanted to add yeah, something? Yeah. Just, I mean, from a, from a just very generic IT deployment perspective, right? There's always three angles that you need to trade off between, right? It's the technology stack that you use, it's the operational measures that you put in place, and then that's the legal security that you have, and, and also to the converse, which is elements of legal insecurity that may arise from the operation of the system, right? <laughs> and if you look at, at, at where we are today, right, you can make a decision and you may have the best technology, but a very bad operational model it won't help you that much. You may have the best technology and some aspects of legal insecurity when you look at the legal basis, right? And that, by the way, is the state of the art of the cloud today, right? If we use a, a U.S. government cloud, a government, a U.S. cloud property, then you end up having a situation where basically the technology has been worked out by very massive companies. Uh, the operational model and the security of the operational model has been greatly simplified so that you effectively don't depend on the total competency of a very large number of people within your organization. You can rely on the operational competency of people who are paid to be obsessed about it. And of course, what you trade off is the fact that you don't have the same legal security and clarity that you had if you were to operate things yourself. And so those trade-offs are inherent into the modern IT world. The other one that's very important to always keep in mind is 
is this notion of, uh, with trust, is the notion of, of privacy by design, right? Trying to minimize how data is organized, how data is collected, uh, making sure that data could be erased, uh, making sure that if data were to be lost, uh, it would not be reversible back to clear data, at least to the extent possible. And, and systems need to be organized to minimize the amount of data they collect. Uh, and then make sure that they manage the data that they do collect in the most privacy-preserving and security-conscious manner. Yeah, yeah. And the most Good. transparent manner as possible. Uh, maybe let, let me on. take up the second part of your question yeah. about regulation. Yeah. And the way you put it, it was like, okay, we need more regulation. Um, to me, it was quite interesting how quickly people ask for regulation and at the same time how they don't want regulation right. at all. They want and favorable that's regu always, that's always a, a difficult thing. I, I personally, yeah. I do think we should limit regulation as much as possible because uh, having good regulation that still keeps uh, enough openness for innovation and competition and these things uh, is, is very, very difficult and be often you know, the markets sort themselves to a certain extent. And that's where, for example, uh, everyone's responsibility comes in, right? So if you're a company, if you're uh, doing a contract with an IT mm -hmm. provider, well, you know, ask them about their security and don't buy the service if they don't offer an adequate level of security. If everyone does that, we don't need to regulate that because the market does. Um, uh, and that's just, just examples. But then there are areas where regulation is needed, right? Regulation can be something that you can use for two things. A, you can level the playing field, so you can take competitive advantage okay. uh, out for those that don't behave to the same set of rules and values that uh, the other market players take. Um, and the other is you can really um, increase, uh, you know, the level of compliance uh, and, and by that add to the level of security. Um, but these are instruments that need to be considered very carefully, and it's also a very different situation. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to find one-size-fits-all yeah, regulation, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Um, and I often get asked, you know, what do we need to do for the small and medium-sized mm -hmm. enterprise? What do we need to do for the big ones? That's completely the wrong measure. Mm -hmm. It's the question of the degree of digitalization. What's the assets that you actually have? If you're a biotech company that has this revolutionary new method um, for, I don't know, genome sequencing or something, uh, well, you need a different protection That's level right. than, uh, you know, the, the, the big e-commerce that, uh, you know, sells fruits or... I'm yeah. making this it's, up, yeah, of course, yeah. but... Uh, the customer database is not something completely different. I'm not saying yeah. it's not valuable, right? right. Yeah, Personal course, data yeah. is something of the most valuable we have. But as, as I said, if you apply data minimization schemes mm -hmm. and basically everything you leak is also in the phone book, that's probably <laughs> less of a problem than a genome database with uh, genomes of a uh, group at risk in our population. Yeah. So it's, it's this risk topic. And regulation isn't the one size fits all. In actual fact, <laughs> there are many, many more measures that can be taken before. Okay, okay. Florin, you mentioned uh, Cyan as a very interesting project before. Uh, Ed, um, well, let's say Cyan would have a Swiss made in Switzerland on top of it if it takes off. What other interesting research do you see? Maybe also at APFL, Security Innovation Park, Center for Digital Trust. What should we look out for? Yeah, so I think one, one of the things that's most interesting sort of in our part of the country is we have the combination of the technology depth at EPFL and La Genève Internationale. And La Genève Internationale is actually sort of moving up and becoming sort of a hub to reflect on, okay. on cybersecurity. There's uh, an interesting uh, set of new initiatives popping up over there. The Cyber Peace Institute is one of them. They're a partner of the Center for Digital Trust. The issue of attribution uh, of attacks is becoming uh, a, a, a significant problem. Uh, it is n poorly defined from a multi-stakeholder perspective. There's no clear understanding between countries on how to reason about attribution of attacks, even yeah. though it is becoming more and more of a pressing problem, a even though now we actually have the demonstrated proof, unfortunately, that a cyber attack, even a form of vandalism, can actually lead to the death of some people in some circumstances. So this the, the ability to create attribution, it's a, it's a the diplomatic mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Uh, and we're looking at it from a technology side. We're also looking at how the impact of technology on the humanitarian sector, mm -hmm. how to provide um, aid to beneficiaries in a uh, 
privacy preserving way in, in countries where the legal basis may be very different or non-existent than we have in the countries we're used to it. So there are a lot of really interesting challenges that are basically at the its intersection between hardcore computer science and the fields of applications. And, and we've talked about health. Uh, I mentioned the humanitarian sector. Uh, we mentioned uh, attribution of attacks coming from rogue countries. Uh, these are all things that we are that are core to the thinking into the, uh, at EPFL right now, and in, in, in more generally speaking, in the area. Okay, very good. I look at the time there. Uh, we're three quarters in. It's about time to see if we have any questions from the audience. Simon is bringing a few. Oh, that's a huge, huge pile. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I hear that we had sound problems for the first two or three minutes um, on the stream. Sorry for your patience and you didn't drop out. I don't know what we missed, but we're not going to repeat it. I'm sorry it's not scripted. I can't <laughs> repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I need to understand this first. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Uh, has any of you news about a dedicated Swiss cloud? U.S. Privacy Shield is a keyword there. Uh, maybe in the context of the national cybersecurity strategy, but it sounds like that should be the private sector first. Uh, well, there's no U.S. Privacy Shield anymore. It's dead, right? It was invalidated. Exactly. So, so what do we do? <laughs> No, I, I just can give you a general answer. I mean, we're not in a vacuum, right? Switzerland is a part of the world and there are foreign countries. And in the end, we need to discuss with these countries and agree on regulations that span, uh, that span our countries uh, because, you know, the internet is global. It's not something um, that only exists within borders. And so, of course, I think where we need to become really good at is to identify upcoming discussions on regulation uh, be it by others or be it uh, on our own need uh, very, very quickly and then formulate the strategy and actually participate in the negotiations. Because if you don't sit at the table, um, you know, in the end you, in my opinion, always end up losing. And even if you sit at the table, you know, you can always say no or yes, that's, that's your decision then. Okay, okay, see that, that typical Swiss problem, we want to be at the table. And we, some of I us don't, don't really a, want to be at the no, table, but I, then we kind of have to be at the table. I have to disagree slightly there because I honestly think the way or, or Switzerland being at the table actually had a very, very positive Im impact on the development of our country. And actually we're known as a, as a very trustworthy and you know, transparent and reliable partner. partner. Uh, I think what's important is we need to make clear what is our interest in something and we also need to declare our interest. We mentioned Zion, you know, I personally think we should have a strong interest that this becomes a global standard. And that's something that we need to put out there. You know, it's always negotiation, give and take and put things on the table. Yeah, and we need to get interest, big guys, big parties, into the thing that was developed in Switzerland, and that is negotiation, obviously. It's negotiation yeah. and showing sense, right? And, and we should not be scared. We can do that. I mean, I, I had discussions with multiple uh, representatives of different countries who are responsible for cybersecurity. We don't have to hide. Actually, what I get pretty often is, uh, we think Switzerland is having a very interesting approach. It's very structured, you know, can we learn from you? Which comes as a surprise <laughs> to me as a Swiss because we tend to be self-critical, but you know, yeah, we get approached yeah, yeah. for that and that's a good sign. Okay. So, so you know, my, my view on, on, on Privacy Shield and, and SHREMS is, uh, or SHREMS 2, is, is it, it, it's an op it's, it will be an opportunity, but I think nobody can really read through the tea leaves and know exactly where this is going to go and the impact that this will have. It's very clear that we now are in an era where there is some legal insecurity uh, there's more legal insecurity than before. Now, some of it is legal insecurity for Facebook and others who are collecting data of citizens, and that's basically it's between citizens and, and, and these large companies. Uh, it does increase the legal insecurity for some uh, companies who want to basically rely on existing uh, U.S. resources, uh, which these companies will have to reason, which is not well understood. And, of course, this is something where uh, these technology giants are, of course, they want to serve customers in a way that actually meets the customer requirements. The migration to the cloud is one of efficiency and scale. And I go back to scaling all the time, right? It's not designed to effectively allow US law to operate on data of non-US entities. That is never the purpose. That's never been the purpose from the perspective of 
these commercial pro awesome. pro providers. It is the reality that they live in, and it, this is where uh, potentially there'll be technical, a combination of technological, operational, and legal solutions to this problem. Um, there were cases of sort of European sovereign uh, cloud deployments uh, based in Germany. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that we will need to really reflect on in Switzerland is, is, is the granularity in which we think about the, bo the borders and scale. And, and if I give the example of, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Swiss system, we have a communal system, right? I think the communes have re generally understood that it's okay if the data of their commune is actually managed in a data center yes. in, in another country. commune. Right? Okay. In okay. another country. Uh, okay, I mean, in another country, right? <laughs> then you actually have a slightly more complicated discussion if you think about would a canton be comfortable having the data of their canton be managed uh, in another canton? And I will remind you, we have 26 of them, including some quite small ones. And of course, you know, Florian and, and, and I will answer well, it's only rational to basically put servers in secure data centers and dedicated facilities, and we probably don't have one of those in every single of our 26 cantons. Mm -hmm. And yet that is actually a conversation where I'm sure that if we were to dive into the details, we would find some very strong resistance by a canton to give up the fact that the absolutely, computers absolutely. that they of their citizens would be running another canton. Of course, this is all anecdotic, right? The real question is Europe, right? Because we need to really think about for which type class of service does Switzerland have the scale to actually have a form of a digital infrastructure. We may have some things that are either very critical and we would run them locally at a premium. Uh, we may have it in some cases where we have a unique selling value proposition where we actually do that, including on an export basis. And in some cases, the rational thing is actually to come up with some kind of an equivalence so that we agree once and for all that Europe is a domain that of equivalency. That was the idea of the privacy shield. That was the Toronto. No, privacy shields are different. Privacy shields are not between European countries. Mm -hmm. Privacy shield is about between Europe and the US. And privacy shield is basically the EU with its critical mass protecting the right of its citizens. And we're not part of it in a way, right? Yeah. We just copied it. What I'm saying is the role of Switzerland with respect to Europe uh, when it comes to IT infrastructure and scaling the infrastructure. And I, I think this is actually going to be a political question that, that the country will have to face at some point. Okay, okay. Good. Uh, another question, which uh, I dropped from my question, but now we have it from the audience, so I have to ask it. So what is the formal relationship between the National Cybersecurity Center and the Führungsunterstützungsbasis of the Army? I mean, you, you made a cut there, but I see them uh, racking up numbers on the military side. They're talking about a cyber battalion now, and these people want to be exercised and, and do something. Wallace, your numbers in your teams, they're growing modest way. Is this because you're much more efficient and they need more people for the same job? Or? No, that wouldn't be fair to say. They're also <laughs> not my team. It's, it's important to understand, uh, I do lead the National Cybersecurity yeah, Center, but first and foremost, I'm the delegate for cybersecurity of the Confederation, not of the EFD, not of the National Cybersecurity Center. I am basically there for everyone, right? And I'm trying to help everyone. And I do think what the military is doing there is absolutely the right thing. Future conflict has a very strong cyber dimension and it only makes sense to invest in capabilities to actually um, you know, defend from and, 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 and operate in these, uh, in these uh, domains. So uh, I think that's one. The second one is we need to be careful with the numbers. There's no real uh, classification of how these numbers are counted, you know, is the, is the person doing maintenance on a server uh, that has security aspects in the job a cybersecurity person or not? How do you count this? There's, there's no agreed rule upon. Uh, to answer the question, how is the collaboration going? And, uh, you know, if you've got more questions in detail, I can't answer it in detail here, but, you know, uh, just write us. So in general, we have the um, Cyber Board of the Confederation with the, uh, with the uh, federal councillors from Department of Defense, Department of Justice and Department of Finance. We have attributed uh, core responsibilities for defense, military and uh, intelligence defense 
in the Department of Defense, uh, the core responsibility for cybercrime in the Department of Justice, and all the rest in the Department of Finance. I represent two entities in that group, uh, A, the core group, which I preside, where I have uh, colleagues from Department of Justice and Department of Defense, where we discuss these uh, processes, how we collaborate across government and so on. And that's where my, my, my colleague, uh, from the Department of Defense actually puts these topics on the table and we discuss them in the group. And then we have the steering committee for the National Cybersecurity Strategy. I'm not going to repeat the full name. Um, and uh, uh, there we actually collaborate, not only government, but also private organizations. You know, we PFL is there, uh, ETH Zurich is there, associations, uh, CyberSafe, a label is there. And we have approximately 80 projects in there. You, you talked about the strategy and there we steer uh, these projects, how they contribute to the national strategy. That's very brief, right? Of course, we have a lot of different entities that sort of fit in that big picture. Okay, good. Um, here is a news bit uh, from Germany where uh, the Bundesland Baden-Württemberg, that's the one across the border in Basel, they opened uh, a phone hotline for, for everybody to, to ring in. And you just told us that you're there for everybody. <laughs> so is that the next thing that is coming? If you really want to respond like the fire brigade, my roof is on fire, my data is on fire. I, I, when I heard you, that would be a surprise. Uh, so in, in the context <laughs> of my answer, I am there for everybody within government. Yeah, uh, critical but, infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, you know, I, my role also involves, you know, collaboration with the public and, and, and being, uh, being here actually as part of my role. Mm -hmm. So um, phones are maybe a little bit 80s. Um, and while I like all this uh, 80s vibe, <laughs> it's probably not going to scale. And, and we discussed, uh, Ed mentioned it often, scale, that, that's really important. We need to learn, we need to become better at scale. I have a vision, though it's a bit uh, daring to talk about it in public, but um, my vision would be a platform where we actually can bring different actors uh, that have uh, a relevancy in the cyber domain, be it cyber risk, be it a very digitized company, be it citizens, where people can participate and where actually communities also can help each other, right? Um, we get a lot of reports from people that got victim of a online fraud or scam, right? Now, of course, we get the email, we send an email back, we explain them what to do, we collaborate with police and everyone to make sure this works. Um, but also there are a lot of things that are not yet really criminal acts, you know, fake extortion and so on, but people are insecure. And I believe if we can build a platform where experts and communities can connect and someone can just ask, hey, I got this email, I'm not sure what to do. And someone, not a government official, just someone can actually answer and say, yeah, I've seen that before. It's not that bad. Don't worry. Report it mm -hmm. to the government and it's done, but you don't have to do anything that could generate an environment of collaboration. And that's actually where we're strong in, in Switzerland. We know each other, we collaborate. You know, if I got a problem where I know Ed can help me, I just call him boom, up. Boom. Yeah, <laughs> but, but again, we also just meet maybe in a forum. We, uh, I've, seen, I've seen in private industry for managing incidents, not just cyber incidents, but general incidents. And we have big ones in the companies. I work from time to time, you know, if, uh, if an online service is down and that's a major part of your business, you lose a lot of money very quick. The most effective instrument was a chat where people mm -hmm. just typed in their answers. Right. You can scroll yeah. back, you can read, you can actually say, oh no, you really said, oh, you know, I forgot. And, and why not use these elements? I'm not saying that everyone then needs to use it. You know, maybe there's also a person that wants to phone in we might not <laughs> offer that, uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, but we have that for example for critical infrastructure. They can call us on the phone 24-7. And they do. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we don't have that many incidents <laughs> that require them to phone us, but if they need to, they do, yes. Okay, okay. There is maybe a final question before we wrap it up. Uh, strategy to secure IT infrastructure of municipalities. So we have, the Federation has three layers, that's state level, Switzerland, small country within Europe, we have the canton level, and a lot of autonomy is happening at the community level, municipality level. And in, within the cyber strategy, make it transparent, I, turn, I took part in one of the workshops, there was an initiative to, to help municipalities to wrap up their, their cyber uh, status or their cyber posture. Uh, is that happening? Or, uh, because I get feeling Switzerland, uh, the government is 
fairly good. They have the money, they have the plans, they have the experts. Cantons, not so well. But then on the municipality level, where people are actually living, they're really behind and they need support. Well, I don't, I don't think it's a fair assessment. You know, there are cantons that are really, really good at what they do. You're just in one, right? Canton de Voice is, is really, really strong in cybersecurity. It's impressive what they do, and they are very invested. At the municipality level, you have some that have a, a fairly decent amount of security and some that don't. Um, what we do within the strategy, for example, we work with that label, Cyber Safe, and okay. we do a pilot there where they basically help municipalities to come to, to implement a, a baseline, security baseline security level, security and then you know they sort of give them a label if they do, and we collaborate there uh, from from a government side uh, under the national cybersecurity strategy, and there are other initiatives. You know, maybe just to add, I think I, I think your question and Florian's answer was in a way a pre-COVID question and a pre-COVID no, answer. answer. And I think what's also legitimate to say is, okay, do we think about COVID, do we think about things differently now that we've got, we've seen sort of what it means to actually be forced something? to go through this massive accelerated digital transformation mm -hmm. because of because of COVID as a side effect of COVID. And and it's very clear, right? Some part of the infrastructure, uh, the educational system and the administration were able to function perfectly fine during the crisis when everybody was working from home and then other things got delayed in a very, very significant way. And I think what we need to do and we will be able to do you know, once the crisis is over, once we'll be post the crisis mode, is to analyze um, in, in which cases the service level agreements that the citizens have with the administration, various parts of the administrations, were met and in which cases the service level agreements were not met during the crisis. And I think this will be very, very closely correlated with, uh, with the level of preparedness from a digital transformation perspective. And I'll give a few examples, right? You know, can you operate with digital signatures with your administration? Right? Can you do all of the regular change management that you would have from an account perspective with the administration over the internet in a safe and secure way? Or do we still rely extensively on pieces of paper going through the mail that will then need to be processed by people who need to be physically yeah. on site in order to handle it. And I think this postmortem will be will be very effective. And I think it is not a cybersecurity question per se, right? But these two things, the digital transformation and the need to secure the infrastructure, because it is so critical, will go hand in hand because what we want is make sure that we have a target that is both efficient uh, as well as secure. Okay, thank you. That, that sounds like a, a good closing word here. I thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Just if I may propose one thing, I see you still have many, many questions oh, on there. So, so if well, you want to hand them over after the chat, uh, actually, YouTube. I could give you some answers that you can then distribute to the audience that didn't get the chance to ask. That, it's that just is, an offer. That is an offer. And then we go through my huge pile of additional <laughs> questions here as well. Thank you for the proposal. Thank so you. that would be on the YouTube channel. I thank you all for watching at home with the patients when we had sound problems. I also thank our sponsors, they're probably one of the slides here. And I thank APFL and you, uh, Ed, for having us. And if you're bored at your home offices and there is no Swiss Cyberstorm today, I recommend watching last year's Cyberstorm talks that you didn't. They're all here on the YouTube channel. Uh, the highest rated based on the feedback of our audience was the one by Tobias Ospold, Michael Hausting, and Dave Lewis. Thank you everybody for watching.